Today's sermon is entitled Repentance to Salvation. Repentance to Salvation. So I want to talk about the topic of repentance. And I want, you know, one thing I want our church to be very clear on is uh, what, what repentance is, and specifically what repentance is in regards to salvation. Now, this is a topic that you, you know, when you're preaching the gospel and you're trying to explain to people salvation is not by works, that you'll come across this a lot because, you know, I think the wrong teaching of repentance to salvation has permeated many churches and, and many Christian circles that you will come across this, I think, very, it's, it's very, very common that people have a misunderstanding of what repentance is in regards to salvation. So I hope this sermon clears it up for you today. And I want to go through the different ways repentance is used in the Bible and different ways people, um, uh, different things that are repented of in the Bible. Now, we believe unashamedly and unap unapologetically that salvation is by grace through faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So it's the grace that saves us, and it's received through faith. So just understand that. This is why I like Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, because it makes that quite clear, that the way we are saved is by grace, through faith. So yes, we do use the phrase, we're saved by faith, but we say that meaning that we are saved by grace, through faith alone. So the reason why that's important is because faith entails more than just the receiving of grace, right? Your faith is also the works that you do. So that's why you may sometimes get confused talking with somebody when they say, yes, they're saved by faith, and my faith is I'm following Jesus. Uh, and partly they're right, because faith is more than just what you believe about salvation, isn't it? Faith is also about what you believe about the Bible, what you believe is right and wrong to do. So when we're talking specifically about salvation, we are saved by grace through faith, because it's grace that saves us, it's grace that keeps us saved, but the faith is the medium by which we receive that grace. Remember, faith is more than just salvation. So just keep that in mind. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, work salvation comes in many forms, some subtle and some not so subtle. Right? So some not so subtle forms are when they say you've got to keep the commandments to be saved. Obedience is required for salvation. That's like not a subtle form of salvation. They say you've got to stop sinning to be saved. That's not a subtle form of work salvation. Or when they say, hey, you know, like the Pentecostals say, you've got to be baptized to be saved, or you've got to keep the sacraments to be saved, or you've got to take communion to be saved. These are very unsubtle ways of work salvation. But the more subtle forms of work salvation is when they say things like, well, you've got to accept Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. Well, that sounds right, but is that what you have to do to be saved? Do you have to accept Jesus as your Lord and Saviour? Or do you just accept him as your saviour, as your Lord, is something that you do all the time? Or they may say, commit your life to Jesus you know, in order to be saved. So that sounds like a good Christian thing to do, commit your life to Jesus, but is that salvation? Is that what you do for salvation? Or is that work salvation, committing your life to Jesus? That's a good work. That's why if you have to commit your life to Jesus to be saved, it's work salvation. What about when they say, you know, make Jesus the Lord of your life? Or another one, and that's the one we're talking about today, when they say, repent of your sins to be saved. That is a subtle form of work salvation, because repenting of your sins is a work. Now, when we preach the gospel, and we tell people salvation is by grace through faith, it's just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, people will accuse us, and falsely, might I add, They'll accuse us of removing repentance from the gospel. They'll say, you know, how come you're not telling people to repent? Why are you removing repentance from the gospel? Why are you preaching the gospel without telling people about repentance and what true repentance is? And, you know, you're not using the word repent. You're not really giving a clear gospel unless you use this word. But did you know the gospel of John Look at what it says here in the Gospel of John. At the end of the Gospel of John, John tells us the reason why he's written the Gospel of John. 
He says here in John 20, verse 30, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of, <coughs> of his disciples, which are not written in his book. But these are written. He's saying, hey, the, the acts that I've written of Jesus Christ in John 20, I didn't write them all, but there's so many that he did that I didn't write. But the reason why I'm writing these, but these are written, why? That ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. So John says the reason why I'm writing the Gospel of John is so that you'll believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and that you'll know he's the Son of God and that you'll believe on the Son of God for everlasting life. That's why a lot of the verses that we use which talk about eternal life, everlasting life, I mean, they come from John. But do you know that the Gospel of John does not use the word repent, repentance, repented one time? So this accusation that you must preach the gospel using the word repent. I mean, did John not preach repentance? Did John leave repentance out of, his, out of the gospel message? Is John removing repentance from the gospel? No, it's because when you preach the gospel, it is preaching repentance at the same time when you understand what repentance to salvation is. So, but you know... You know, but we understand people's concern, right? We understand why they're concerned about this because their concern is people who claim to be Christians or people that are Christians aren't living the way they would like a Christian to live or the way God would want a Christian to live. You know, Christians that are not striving to be Christ-like. That's their concern, you know? That when you talk to them, that's what they're worried about. They say, like, well, there's all these people saying they're Christians, but look at the way they live. Now, every Christian is guilty of this to a certain degree, right? Because we're not perfect. See, if it weren't the case that every Christian were guilty to this, of this to a certain degree, then every saved person would be sinless. But that's just not the case, right? The Bible tells us here, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So this is why I always, you know, it always, um, you know, surprises me a bit when you, you run into a Christian, knowledgeable about the Bible, and yet they say things like, oh, I don't have any desire to sin. Well, if you didn't have any desire to sin, then you wouldn't be sinning. The fact that you sin means there, the desire is still there. Otherwise, you wouldn't be sinning. Um, and this is why the Bible says, you know, the, these people that think, that they don't want to sin anymore, they have no desire to sin anymore. Uh, you know, they, they, they say, oh yeah, but the only the sin I do is just the accidental sin, it's not the, the willful sin. And these people are so deceived that they don't even, they're not even truthful with their own self. That, you know, I think if the, the, the more you realize the standard by which God expects and what he wants of the Christian, the more you realize you come short, the more you realize you do, you, you do things that you know, you know you're not meant to do and all these sorts of things. That you, you're, we're sinful creatures, right? And this, is, this brings us you know, before God in humility, right? That we need a saviour. But you know, when people sometimes believe in work salvation, they set that arbitrary bar low enough, they want to be over that bar because nobody's going to preach, think about it, right? Nobody's going to preach a work salvation that they themselves do not meet. You know, who's going to be excited to go out preaching a message where they're condemning themselves? So they always preach it in a way that their level of living is just enough to get them over that bar. So I understand their concern. I mean, I mean, believe me, I want believers to live a life pleasing to God too. You know, I, I want that same, I have that same desire. I want, I, I want people who claim the name of Jesus Christ to live a life pleasing to Jesus Christ as well. But am I, am I going to change the gospel message in order to achieve that? Is that the solution? Is the solution to change the simplicity of the gospel message in order to change people's behaviour after salvation? So we need to exhort Christians to do good without adding works to the gospel. That's what we need to do. Now people will say, you know, John the Baptist, Jesus, the apostles, they preach repentance, and of course they did. You know, nobody is disputing 
that the word repentance is used in the Bible in reference to salvation. The question is, what does this word mean? And does it mean turn from sin, this word? And if repentance, what the, that, that's the question, right? That's, this, this is the crux of the issue. We need to have a right definition of repentance that actually it makes sense in all the verses in the Bible that it is used. And the question is, what are you repenting from for salvation? Is it from sin? So this is what I want to talk about today in this sermon. There's four different things that get repented from in the Bible. And we'll, and we'll go to some verses and we'll talk about each one so you can see it for yourself. That repentance is just not this one term that means that thing every single time. And if it did, it creates problems if you define it that way. So, <clears throat> the first one we're going to look at is repentance from evil. Repentance from evil. Now, repentance from evil is not the same as... Evil is not the same as sin. Now, evil sometimes is sin, but evil not, is not always sin. Why? Because God repents from evil. God does evil. So that may not sound right to you, because if you believe evil is always sinful and you say God does evil, <coughs> you're saying, well, no, no, wait, God is sinless. Well, it's because doing evil is not always sinful. Evil is when you bring harm on another person. But it's not always wrong to bring harm onto another person. Think about the court system. You know, let's say we had a just court system and we had capital punishment for certain crimes, right? If a judge sentences somebody to capital punishment, I mean, even sentencing them to life in prison is, is removing their liberty, you know, for the rest of their life. That's bringing harm to somebody. That's harmful to somebody. But is it sinful? No, because when it's done in justice, it's, it's not sinful. So this is why God brings evil on people. I mean, hell is an evil place, right? It's a place of judgment and torment and wrath. It's not nice down there. But that's the righteous judgment of God. It's not sinful for God to send people to hell, but it's doing evil to people. So let's look at Jonah 3, 5, down to 10. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. So you know the story. Jonah, swallowed by the whale, three days and three nights, spat out on the shore. And he goes into the heart of Nineveh and he's preaching for them to... Repent, right? For, for word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. So he's... he's calling on this city to repent. And they do, right? The city does turn from their evil way. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. So you see how evil can be sinful, like the Ninevites, you know, um, committing sin. But it's not always evil. Right? Because God does evil too. Now look at verse 9. Who can tell if God will turn and repent? So who's doing the repenting here? God is doing the repenting. So if repentance in and of itself means to turn from sin, that's not possible because God doesn't have any sin to turn from. So you see how you can't just have one definition of repentance, meaning it means to turn from sin, because it, it doesn't work throughout the whole Bible. It doesn't work specifically in Jonah 3 as well. And not only that, look at verse 10. And God saw their works. What did he see? What was the works that they did that God saw? That they turned from their evil way. See, so their evil way was sin. They were turning from sin. They were turning from this evil. And God says he saw their works. Now that's no coincidence that the Bible is using the term works here and we say we're not saved by works, right? Because 
turning from your evil way is works. And therefore, if we require people to turn from their sin, to turn from their evil way in order to be saved, that is preaching a work salvation. So not only do we see in Jonah 3 that God repents, so therefore repentance cannot mean in and of itself to turn from sin, we also see that turning from your evil way is works. So therefore, if you need to turn from your evil way to be saved, that is work salvation. Jeremiah 18, 7. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. So that's one thing to repent from in the Bible, is you repent from evil. That's not the same as repenting from sin. Now, sometimes it's the same, like the Ninevites were turning from sin. God, though, was turning from evil. He was not turning from sin. So God repenting doesn't always mean repenting from sin. So the word in and of itself does not refer to turning from sin. It's repenting from something. What are they repenting from? Well, in the first example, they are repent, repenting from evil. Let's look at the next one. So repentance is not only used to talk about turning from something evil or something sinful. You can also repent from doing something that is good. So repentance in and of itself doesn't always refer to the going from something bad to going to something good. Repentance can also mean going from something good to going to something evil or going to something bad. So repentance from good. Look at Jeremiah 18, 9 to 10. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it. So this sounds very familiar to the verse in Jeremiah we just looked at, right? Which was 7 and 8. Because that's one side of repentance from evil, that God repented of the evil that he was going to do to the city. But look at what he says here in, in the next two verses, Jeremiah 18 verse 9. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent, look, of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. So you see how 7 and 8 is saying, hey, if they turn from their evil, then I'm going to turn from the evil that I would do to the city. And then 9 and 10 says, yeah, but if they, can, they do evil in my sight and they don't obey my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. You see, so God can repent from evil, but he also can repent from good. Now, Genesis 6 is another example. This is the first time repentance is mentioned in the Bible. The first time repent is mentioned in the Bible, it's not man repenting, it's God repenting. Genesis 6, 5 says here, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. So see how he's repenting of making man? But making man was a good thing. Remember, he looked at all his creation. He said, behold, it was very good. So he's repenting of something that was good because of the choice of man to sin against God. And to, you know, as the Bible says here, every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So you see how not only is he saying about man in those days, it's just outwardly was violent and outwardly sinful, but even the thoughts and imaginations of the of the heart of man was only evil continually and then he repented that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart so that's another example of repentance from good now let's talk about repentance from sin repentance from sin so this is one where most a lot of people when they talk about the gospel they think that repentance in regards to salvation is this type of repentance where you're repenting from sin now is there repentance from sin in the Bible? Yes, it's in the Bible, but is it in regards to salvation? No, I don't believe it is. Now, let's just get a clear picture here in Ezekiel 18 of what repentance of sin is. Ezekiel 18.21 says, But if the wicked 
will turn from all his sins that he hath committed and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. So you see how turning from all his sins, that's what he's commanding here. He's saying, hey, well, there's going to be mercy there if the wicked turn from all his sins. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? But when the righteous, but when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity. So you see how in this passage, when you turn away from iniquity and you do right, these are the same things because in order to turn away from iniquity, you have to do right. And in order to turn away from doing right, you commit iniquity. These are not two separate things. In order to turn from sin, you have to keep the commandments. And this is why when people say you need to repent of sins to be saved, all they're saying another way is that they have to keep the commandments to be saved. But see, nobody would just say in their right mind, keep the commandments to be saved, because they know that is blatant work salvation. But when they say to people, turn from your sins in order to be saved, they're just saying, keep the commandments another way. Just like here. This is why the Bible goes back and forth between these two, because these are opposites of the same coin. And when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned in them, shall he die. Yet ye say, the way of the Lord is not equal. Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal, are not your ways unequal? When a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness, and committeth iniquity, see, see the opposite there, and dieth in them, for his iniquity that he hath done shall he die. Again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed, and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive, because he considereth and turneth away from all his transgressions that he hath committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Yet saith the house of Israel, the way of the Lord is not equal, O house of Israel, are not my ways equal, are not your ways unequal. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Now, what is being said here in Ezekiel 18? Because some people might read that and say, wait a second, isn't that saying, turn from your sins and you'll get mercy, you'll be saved? Yeah, well, let me say it to you another way, right? Keep the commandments, obey all the law, and you will live. Now, does that give you any hope? So it's the same thing here when people say, ah, see, there you go, there's repentance of sin for salvation. No, because there's no hope in keeping the law to be saved. So then the question is, if, how is this fulfilled? Why, first of all, why is this even in the Bible, right? Because this, this is the old covenant, right? The old covenant of keep the commandments to be blessed, don't keep the commandments, you're going to be cursed. So this is like saying, hey, be righteous and you'll receive mercy. But then who is righteous? Right? Who does repent of all their sins? Right? We can't. So how in the New Testament is it revealed? How do people turn from their iniquity and turn to righteousness? It's by believing on Jesus Christ. We get that imputed righteousness. It's not our own righteousness, which are as filthy rags. So you see, that's the full picture but people will use passages like this to teach a work salvation they don't even use passages like this consistently right because they know if they say keep the commandments to be saved that that's heresy that's work salvation so what do they then say they'll say then well it's not that you have to keep the commandments you know you just have to be willing to keep the commandments right you just have to try your best you know? But is that, what this, is that what this passage says? I mean, this passage was pretty clear that it's like, turn away from all transgressions. 
turn away. You know, I mean, we, I won't read through it again, but how many times did you say, let me just pull up an example. If the wicked will turn from some of his sins, if the wicked will just be willing to turn from his sins and just the, the ones that he turned from, that was good enough, you know, and then he's going to be saved. No, it says he will turn from all his sins that he committed. Why? Because the, the, the bar for work salvation is perfection. You need to keep all the law, like he says in Galatians 5. He's a debtor to do the whole law, right? So this is what is being preached here. And that's what's being preached. That's what we can't keep. That turning from sin to be saved. And this is why it's just work salvation. So this is not willing to repent in the Bible. And, and you know what they say when they say, you know, you just have to be willing to be saved. I, I say this a lot. People will say, you don't have to turn from all your sin to be saved. You just have to be willing to turn from sin. But then if you don't turn from all your sin, they'll just say, well, you aren't really willing. So it's just like, so this whole willingness is just, just trying to soften the blow of this heresy of work salvation. But they just bring it back to works because if you don't, you know, if you, if you don't actually do the works, then you weren't willing to do the works. Let's go to Revelation 3. Let's look at a few other examples. Revelation 3, this is another example of repentance from sin in the Bible. Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I would spew thee out of my mouth. <coughs> so God is saying here that the lukewarm Christian, the Christian that's neither cold nor hot, it makes him sick, right? He wants to spew it out of his mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous, therefore, and repent. So he wants them to repent of their sins here, but is he saying this to unbelievers? I mean, he's saying to a church of believers that they, they have good, they have bad, but he wants them to turn from that bad. But this is not a passage about salvation. This is a passage about exhorting believers to do right. And there's nothing wrong with repentance of sin for the believer. That's where it belongs. But this is not, a, this is not you know, a passage about salvation. Right? And if it was, it would be teaching work salvation. Acts 8, 9. This is a, the, another example of repentance from sin in the Bible. This is uh, the, Simon the sorcerer. So we'll just read uh, a couple of verses at the beginning of Acts chapter 8, verse 9. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs, which were done. So just reading there to make the point that Simon the sorcerer got saved. He, was, he believed and he got baptized by Philip. Now later on, when he meets Peter and uh, I believe it's uh, uh, John that he's with, it says here, when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, so this is Simon the sorcerer, the Holy Ghost was given he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. So he wanted to buy this, this ability to be able to give the Holy Ghost, the, the, the gifts of the Holy Ghost to others. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. You see how he wants to buy spiritual influence with money. Thou hast neither pot, part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness. Right? So he's not necessarily calling him to salvation. He's just saying, hey, this thought that you have, that you want to buy the power of the Holy Ghost with money, he's saying, repent from this. 
and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. So that's another example in the Bible of repentance from sin. And this is not what it is in regards to salvation, because it's, it's, uh, that's works. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 7. I want to explain to you what I, what I believe is being said here in 2 Corinthians 7. This is where we started when we read 2 Corinthians 7. Now what's interesting about this passage is that we've already talked about some of the different types of repentance. You know, repentance from evil, repentance from good, repentance from sin, and then we're going to talk about later the repentance to salvation, which is mentioned here. And we'll talk about what that is in the last part. But we see that three of the four types of what we repent from in this passage alone in 2 Corinthians 7. So let's read here in verse 8. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. And what is he talking about here? <coughs> if you know 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, uh, well, if you know 1 Corinthians, you know 1 Corinthians, Paul was addressing a lot of problems in the 1 Corinthian church believers suing one another he's addressing fornication he's addressing abuse of the lord's supper he's addressing um, division in the church he, he's he, you know fornication interest there was a fornicator in the church that they allowed to stay within the church and he's saying hey purge out this leaven from the church so this is the letter that he's referring to he's referring to the previous letter which is first corinthians this is addressing a lot of the problems but what was great about the corinthian church is that they did something about those problems Right? And this is what he's referring to here. He says, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. What is, what is he saying then? He's saying, he wrote them a letter. Now, was that a good thing or a bad thing? That was a good thing. Right? He's saying, I don't want to repent. I'm not repenting of writing that letter. Right? So you see how that's the repentance from good. But then he's saying, though I did repent. So he's saying that there was a time where he was wondering whether that was the right thing to do. But now he's like saying, no, it was the right thing to do. I do not repent. Though I did repent. Right? For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry. So he's saying, I'm not rejoicing just because you admitted your wrongs. Right? And, and you realize that you were wrong but that she sorrowed to repentance. So he's saying that the sorrow, the type of sorrow that you had actually led to a change, right? For you were made sorry after a godly matter. And see, it was a good change because the change went to something that was in the will of God, not something that's wrong. So, so what Paul is talking about here is he's actually highlighting the difference between a good type of sorrow and a bad type of sorrow, right? For you were made sorry after a godly manner so this is the godly sorrow that he's referring to that she might receive damage by us in nothing what is he referring to there that in the way that which they received the rebuke the godly sorrow actually it helped them as opposed to hindered them because they responded the right way they had the godly sorrow for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of but the sorrow of the world worketh death so this is the contrast being laid out here that there is a good type of sorrow and there's a bad type of sorrow because sometimes people get sorry over something or they're offended at something or they realize they're wrong for something but then they have the wrong reaction maybe they get proud maybe they get offended maybe they get sorrowful they you know go don't go down something god wants them to do but something the world has them to do like there are a lot of self-help seminars and all that, that sort of stuff he says, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. But behold this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness in wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge, in all things ye have reproved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Now some people use this passage <coughs> to say <coughs> that repentance is godly sorrow but that wouldn't make sense because if repentance is godly sorrow 
then how does godly sorrow lead to repentance? Right? If godly sorrow works repentance, how can repentance be godly sorrow? Right? So you know, sometimes when people say, oh yeah, repentance is not like a term, it's just being a godly sorrow over your sin. Well, that's not what repentance is. Because if repentance, like I said, was godly sorrow, godly sorrow would not lead to repentance to salvation. Now, what is godly sorrow? Right? Now, one thing you have to admit in order to be saved is admitting you're a sinner and that you deserve hell. So admitting you're a sinner is required for salvation, but repentance is not the right word to describe that. Now, is admitting you're a sinner deserving of hell, godly sorrow? You know, if, well, if, if that admission of your guilt and that realization of the punishment leads you to believe on Jesus Christ, I don't have a problem with saying that, okay, that's somebody who is sorry for their sin. They realize the, the problem that their sin has caused on themselves and it's leading them to want to make a change. But what is the change that needs to be made in order to be saved? That's what we're going to talk about in the next section. But where people get confused is they think they, 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 I think they misunderstand this passage. And, and you know, it's, it's one of the harder passages to understand. But I think what Paul is saying here, see in verse 9, he's talking about you know, the fact that they did turn from doing wrong things to do right things. And it was a godly sorrow that led them to do that. But what I don't think he's saying in verse 10, that that godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, requires the same acts that they did in verse 9. So what is he saying here? What I believe he's saying here in verse 8, he's saying he wrote the letter and he's saying he doesn't repent. He hasn't he doesn't changed his mind. He hasn't turned from doing the good of writing the letter. Though at one point he did question it because he wasn't rejoicing in the fact that he made them sorry. But he wrote the letter and he's saying he doesn't repent of the letter. Now what's verse 9 saying? Verse 9 is saying, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. So he's glad that their realisation of their wrongs actually made them do something about it. And then in verse 10 he's saying, In the same way when it comes to salvation, when we realise we've wronged God, that leads us to want to repent to salvation. Now, what does that mean? What does repentance to salvation mean? Well, we're going to talk about that a bit later. But he's saying in the same way that a godly sorrow leads somebody to get saved, your godly sorrow led you to do something different in the Corinthian church, right? To, to turn from those sins. So you see how godly sorrow is not repentance. Godly sorrow leads to a change. But if the change that you're that you're requiring in order to be saved is to turn from sins and to do what the Corinthian church did and got all these things right. That's work salvation. But he's just saying here, the godly sorrow is what's good. He's comparing it to the sorrow of the world that works death. And he's saying, just like godly sorrow leads people to getting saved, hey, this godly sorrow in you also led you to do things, right, that were right. But then is, it, is he saying it's a requirement for salvation? Turning from sin? No. He's just saying, hey, the godly sorrow can lead people to do, to, to, to make changes in their life. And just like in the Christian life, a godly sorrow over your sin leads you to get saved, but as you learn and as you grow, there's godly sorrow of the sin in your life that you're trying to turn from as well. So it's a, it's a daily thing. That's what he's saying in verse 10. And then he's saying, hey, see, in this same self-same thing, right, in this same situation, you sorrowed after a godly sorrow. So like we have godly sorrow when it comes to salvation, we have godly sorrow in our Christian life, and look at how it's helping you to grow, right, and the things that they, that they do there. So that, I believe, is the right understanding of what he's explaining in 2 Corinthians 7. Now let's go on to Matthew 27. Matthew 27 gives us an example of somebody that did repent of their sin and is not saved. So I don't know if you realise this in Matthew 27. It says here, Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself 
and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. So here is somebody that was sorry for what they did, but it wasn't a godly sorrow, because the Bible says the sorrow of the world worketh death, because when Judas repented of betraying Jesus, he went and hung himself, and he died, and he went to hell. So we don't know the motivation behind that, but you know the Bible tells us in First, Second Corinthians 7, there's a sorrow, there's a godly sorrow that worketh repentance to salvation, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. And I think this is an example here where people can repent of their sins. That doesn't mean that they're saved, that they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ if it doesn't lead them to repentance, to salvation. Now, what is the right type of repentance for salvation? The last one is repentance from dead works. So notice here, we talked about John, Jesus, the disciples preaching repentance. But nowhere here did they ever say, repent of your sins. Matthew 3, 1, look at what it says here. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 4, here's Jesus. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So notice, so what type of repentance is this? I mean, we could, we, we could equally be in error saying, oh, look, here's repentance. They're telling everyone to repent of the good and to commit iniquity. Well, of course not, right? Because it, it doesn't match what is being called here to do in order to maintain salvation by grace. Mark 6, here's the disciples here. He called unto him the twelve and began to send them forth by two and two and gave them power over unclean spirits. And they went out and preached that men should repent. So are they preaching that men should repent of their sins? They should repent from evil? They should repent from good? No, what type of repentance is this? Well, we don't have to wonder what their message was. We don't have to guess. We don't have to argue about what their message was because Acts 19 actually defines their message. Acts 19. Paul comes across, we, we talked about this recently when we looked at it. He comes across disciples. They're not saved. He asked them, well, then unto what then were ye baptized? Verse 3. They said unto John's baptism. Then Paul, then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. See, that was the message of repentance. When they were saying to repent, what was the message of the baptism of repentance? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why John's gospel doesn't need to use the word repent to be preaching repentance because preaching believe on the Lord Jesus Christ is preaching the baptism of repentance. You see, because that's the change that needs to take place. You need, you're not believing on Jesus Christ. You need to turn from that to believing on Jesus Christ. Hebrews 6, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. This is where I get the title of this section from. Right? It's repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. So dead works is not sin, right? because nobody's trusting their sin to get them to heaven. What they're trusting to get them to heaven is their good works. And this is why they need to turn from those good works or from those work, those dead works that are not going to save them and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the repentance that is required for salvation. Of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying out of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. This will we do if God permit. So when we go back to John's preaching, what were they preaching when they were preaching repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand well look at mark here mark makes it a bit clearer mark 1 4 says john did baptize in the wilderness and what did he preach he preached the baptism of repentance 
for the remission of sins. So what was he preaching in Mark 1, 4? Believe on him which would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Mark 1, 14, look at Jesus here. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So you see how it's repenting from dead works and of faith toward God. It lines up with one of the principles of the faith, which is repentance from dead works and faith toward God. So in conclusion, to make it very clear today, you know, repent is a verb that means to turn. But what are you turning from is, depends on what the passage is referring to. You can turn from different things. But repentance to salvation cannot be repentance from sin, otherwise that would be work salvation. And this is why the repentance in regards to salvation is the repentance from dead works. So do we believe in repenting from sin? Yes, we do. You know, it's, it's, for the, it's for the believer, but not for the unbeliever to be saved. That's why good works are a good thing, but when you require good works to be saved, that's when you get into heresy. All right, so I hope that's very clear to you. This is something you have to understand very well, not just for your own good, but also for when you have discourse with others, because this conversation comes up a lot and if you're not sure if you're not understanding of how repentance works in this then people will start to teach a work salvation and you won't know where you're going wrong because sometimes you go wrong just because you have the wrong definitions all right, all right let's pray lord thank you for your word thank you for uh, the clear teaching of scripture on on salvation and uh, we thank you lord uh, that we have your word to study and uh, be exhorted from and rebuked from. Pray, Lord, that you give everyone in our church a clear understanding of salvation so that we are not uh, messed up or tricked into or deceived into a workspace salvation. And I pray, Lord, that you know, we understand this clearly so we can preach this clearly and we can help others to understand what <coughs> repentance to salvation is. <coughs> We thank you, we praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.